we have a lot to discuss about Starship Flight 2 especially as more information has trickled out from the usual sources. SpaceX themselves even put out a list of everything they've learned about Starship's second test flight. But that's not all. We also got some pretty huge news this week, as Elon took to Twitter to tease what's next for Starship and detailed some upcoming design changes to the vehicle's upper stage. Howdy, Tank Watchers. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. The week started off with lots of inspections. Workers were visible on the orbital launch mount and on the water-cooled steel plate, looking carefully for any damage Flight 2 may have caused. SpaceX also provided an update regarding Starbase's Stage 0 infrastructure, with the first data looking great. The update on their website says, quote, the water-cooled flame deflector and other pad upgrades performed as expected, requiring minimal post-launch work to be ready for upcoming vehicle tests and the next integrated flight test. Now, this is great news, especially for those of us that were worried before Flight 2 that the booster lifting off the mount might do a little destroying the pad again. We can see in this footage how the booster QD is already on the move again, which indicates it might also have survived the launch without significant issues. Great news! And all of this is underscored by the fact that SpaceX opened up the pad here just three hours after launch. I'm going to keep talking about this because it's truly insane. I've spent more time waiting to gain access to launch pads after Falcon 9 and Delta IV heavy launches. Really outstanding work by all teams at SpaceX to get Stage 0 in a more robust shape. Next up, the chopsticks. Now, these were a big worry ahead of Flight 2, as after Flight 1, they were in their launch position for an extended period of time, and the drawworks that they're connected to took some significant concrete damage. But this time, things are looking bright. The chopsticks were moved about an hour after launch when they were lowered down the tower. Then a few days later, they were raised and closed because they were still in the open launch configuration. Workers are now inspecting the chopsticks and starting work on any minor refurbishment that may be needed to them. Finally, though there appears to be more buckling damage to the vertical orbital tank farm tanks, the concrete underneath the orbital launch mount appears in good shape. We could see a few small discolored areas in the Fondag around the steel plate when we flew last week, but nothing too concerning and certainly nothing like the massive crater that was formed during Flight 1. Moving right along, one of the suspected new booster transport stands was on the move this week. Specifically, it was moved over to the Sanchez hardware area. We will see when one of these will be used for the first time, but in theory, they would allow for more space inside the engine area to make working there easier while the booster is on the stand. All right, before we move on to the gigantic Starship news that we got this week, let's take a moment to recap some of the other statements that SpaceX has made regarding Starship Flight 2. But even before that, I have to let you know that our Black Friday bundle deal is ongoing at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Grab yourself a hoodie and some metal prints and get a sweet discount while doing so. We'll Put the link in the description. Regarding Raptor engines, SpaceX confirmed what we already knew. All 33 engines on the Super Heavy booster successfully ignited, and not only that, they stayed lit and completed a full duration burn during the booster's ascent. It's great to see this confirmed, and hopefully SpaceX is able to do this again and again, and eventually put to rest some concerns that people have about Raptor reliability. SpaceX also called the hot stage separation successful. The booster shut down all but three engines, and the ship ignited all of its six engines. Once again, I can't get over how beautiful the booster engine shutdown sequence is. It's just gorgeous. The ship's final altitude was about 150 kilometers, with a speed of roughly 24,000 kilometers an hour, which is just short of what it needed for the correct trajectory to Hawaii. But it's still the first time Starship has reached space no matter what altitude you define for that. About the conclusion of the test, SpaceX said, quote, the flight test's conclusion came when telemetry was lost near the end of second stage burn, before engine cutoff, after more than eight minutes of flight. The team verified a safe command destruct was appropriately triggered based on available vehicle performance data. Now, we don't have any more info than that, so we can't definitively say why the loss of control happened. Could there have been something with the Raptors? Perhaps something related to the hydraulic TVC that Ship 25 has 
compared to the electric TVC that's coming on future ships, similar to what we saw with the booster during Flight 1. Or maybe there was a propellant slosh issue or some sort of propellant leak for some reason. Either way, we don't know, and we'll have to do the usual thing and wait to see if we find out. Of course, SpaceX and the FAA, with their mishap investigation, will dig deeper into this and properly understand what went wrong during the flight, and most importantly, how to fix it on future flights. Speaking of future flights, let's get into the big news we got regarding Starship this week. Elon Musk took to Twitter to detail some changes coming to the Starship system after the current crop of vehicles, which he referred to as V1. This includes Ship 28, which is designated for the next test flight, as well as Ships 29, 30, 31, and 32, all seen here in and around the high bay as SpaceX shuffled vehicles around this week. That's right, we had a bona fide Starship shuffle this week, as Ship 28 was moved out of the Rocket Garden and into the high bay, while Ship 31 was moved out of the high bay and into the Rocket Garden. All of this was watched over by Ship 30, which was moved out of the high bay and into the ring yard, and then back into the high bay. This is all likely a workstation shuffle, as different parts of the high bay are used for different steps of vehicle construction. So right now, this would mean up to five more flights of the initial V1 configuration of Starship. This might also be needed to bridge a gap in the production flow, as SpaceX is changing a lot around in Starbase during the move from a tent-based to star factory-based infrastructure. Production might understandably slow down during this before we see the next step to V2. Yes, you heard me right. Starship version 2 is coming. According to Elon, V2 holds more fuel, reduces dry mass, and improves reliability. So let's unpack each of these things step by step. The first item, holding more fuel, is kind of a slam dunk. In fact, Elon has teased before that a stretched version of Starship would be coming eventually. But now we know that version 2 of Starship will in fact be stretched to hold more fuel. A longer ship also has some implications on hardware aside from the fact that it can hold more fuel. First, the wet mass will rise, of course, because it's carrying more fuel. So this could also be the moment when SpaceX changes from a 6 to 9 engine configuration for Starship, although at the time of writing, this particular detail hasn't been confirmed. But it does make sense. The additional engines might be needed to provide the ship with the appropriate amount of thrust to get into space. However, Raptor engines, for example, a V3 version of Raptor, might also be required or included here in the bigger picture, either just to fit them in the vehicle or just for the increased thrust, or maybe both, or something else I'm not even thinking of. What exactly will happen here remains to be seen, but it's hard to not expect an overall thrust increase to go along with stretching Starship's tanks. Besides the direct vehicle implications, a bigger ship could also mean either a move of the chopstick attach points or a modification of the tower and chopsticks themselves to allow proper stacking of ship on booster, as the chopsticks are very close to maxed out in their current configuration. Of course, this is all dictated by the meaning of a stretched ship. Does it mean two meters longer or 10 meters longer? Hopefully the problem is solved just by moving the lifting points on the ship, since modifications to the tower strike me as a fairly labor-intensive process. Next up on the list of changes to Starship version two, mentioned by Elon, reduced dry mass. This one is a bit of a simpler step in terms of overall implications for the hardware and ground support equipment. The easy way to do that is reduce the amount of steel they use for Starship's tank walls. This might, for example, be a reduction in steel thickness, which is another thing that's been teased for a long time. We've seen SpaceX producing test tanks in the past, usually to research tank thickness and other structural items. This change might spark a test tank campaign again, which will almost certainly kick off at Massey's, and we'll keep our eyes open for any new test articles, and we'll keep a vigilant watch of the goings-on at Massey's with our cameras. This change might sound simple on paper, just reduce the tank wall thickness, but it has broad implications overall to the stability of the vehicle. A thinner tank wall means the vehicle might break up at high pressure, or during high energy flight phases. So while this change does not require a change in the overall hardware of the Stage Zero system or the construction of the vehicle itself, it might result in some tough learning experiences and perhaps even necessitate additional testing to be done. Now, improved reliability is the dark horse of this list. There are a lot of different things that could be changed and tweaked that might help here. Guidance, Raptors, purging systems for the Raptors, 
everything is on the table that could result in a reliability improvement. Based on the previous FAA mishap investigation, it might be a situation where a long list of items together results in the overall desired result. This could also include stage zero reliability, valves, vents, and whatnot that could be removed as a failure point, and any other improvements. And of course, there's a ton of other changes here that Elon did not specifically mention, but might be involved in a future version two of Starship. The main one is the forward flap geometry and their position on the ship itself, which was teased as a possible change literally years ago. The flaps could be moved further toward the leeward or non-tiled part of the ship to improve airflow. Now, this is a change that I'm slightly apprehensive about, to be honest, as the current look of Starship just seems right to me. Changing the tank wall thickness or the number of Raptors is all well and good, but changing the silhouette of Starship, I mean, it just sort of will look wrong for a period of time, until we get used to it, at least. Another possible change that wasn't mentioned by Elon, but isn't too far out of the realm of possibility, would be things that they've learned about the TPS tile system. While Starship did not reach re-entry on this flight, and thus it ultimately didn't matter, we still saw Ship 25 lose a significant number of tiles on its way to space. SpaceX hopefully has some data that will help them understand why some tiles are lost and others stay on, and they can improve that on upcoming heat shield designs. Most of the heat shields on current vehicles are already partially or completely done, so it might be too late to introduce groundbreaking changes to these vehicles, and thus, this would be something that they do for V2. So all of this just begs the question, how many of the five currently in production V1 vehicles will fly between now and version two? SpaceX in the past has felt no mercy skipping vehicles if they thought it was necessary. It's safe to assume that Booster 10 and Ship 28 are probably safe, as no V2 vehicle is even stacked yet. But the later the vehicles are into the V1 list, the more likely they will get skipped to focus on a V2 vehicle of the future. Remember ships 16 through 23? Yeah, so do we. So let us know what you think in the comments. How many V1 vehicles will end up flying? And when will we see V2 for the first time? I, for one, can't wait to see the future of Starship unfold before our eyes. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. And as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.